to the consideration of which we shall now return. Courage was scarcely deemed worthy to be counted among virtues, unless it was exercised in the cause of righteousness. In his Analects Confucius defines courage by explaining, as is often his wont, what its negative is. Perceiving what is right, he says, and doing it not, argues lack of courage. Put this epigram into a positive statement, and it runs, courage is doing what is right. To run all kinds of hazards, to jeopardize oneself, to rush into the jaws of death, these are too often identified with valor, and in the profession of arms such rashness of conduct, what Shakespeare calls, valor misbegot, is unjustly applauded, but not so in the precepts of knighthood. Death for a cause unworthy of dying for, was called a dog's death. To rush into the thick of battle and to be slain in it, says a prince of Medo, is easy enough, and the merest churl is equal to the task, but, he continues, it is true courage to live when it is right to live, and to die only when it is right to die, and yet the prince had not even heard of the name of Plato, who defines courage as the knowledge of things that a man should fear and that he should not fear. A distinction which is made in the West between moral and physical courage has long been recognized among us. What samurai youth has not heard of great valor and the valor of a villain? Valor, fortitude, bravery, fearlessness, courage, being the qualities of soul which appeal most easily to juvenile minds, and which can be trained by exercise and example, were, so to speak, the most popular virtues, early emulated among the youth. Stories of military exploits were repeated almost before boys left their mother's breast. Does a little booby cry for any ache? The mother scolds him in this fashion, what a coward to cry for a trifling pain. What will you do when your arm is cut off in battle? What when you are called upon to commit harakiri? We all know the pathetic fortitude of a famished little boy prince of Sendai, who in the drama is made to say to his little page, Sayest thou those tiny sparrows in the nest, how their yellow bills are open wide, and now see. There comes their mother with worms to feed them. How eagerly and happily the little ones eat. But for a samurai, when his stomach is empty, it is a disgrace to feel hunger. Anecdotes of fortitude and bravery abound in nursery tales, though stories of this kind are not by any means the only method of early imbuing the spirit with daring and fearlessness. Parents, with sternness sometimes verging on cruelty, set their children to tasks that called forth all the pluck that was in them. Bears hurl their cubs down the gorge, they said. Samurai sons were let down the steep valleys of hardship and spurred to Sisyphus-like tasks. Occasional deprivation of food or exposure to cold was considered a highly efficacious test for inuring them to endurance. Children of tender age were sent among utter strangers with some message to deliver, were made to rise before the sun, and before breakfast attend to their reading exercises, walking to their teacher with bare feet in the cold of winter, they frequently, once or twice a month, as on the festival of a god of learning, came together in small groups and passed the night without sleep, in reading aloud by turns. Pilgrimages to all sorts of uncanny places, to execution grounds, to graveyards, to houses reputed to be haunted, were favorite pastimes of the young. In the days when decapitation was public, not only were small boys sent to witness the ghastly scene, but they were made to visit alone the place in the darkness of night and there to leave a mark of their visit on the trunkless head. Does this ultra-Spartan system of drilling the nerves strike the modern pedagogist with horror and doubt doubt whether the tendency would not be brutalizing, nipping in the bud the tender emotions of the heart? Let us see what other concepts Bushido had of valor. The spiritual aspect of valor is evidenced by composure, calm presence of mind. Tranquility is courage in repose. It is a statical manifestation of valor as daring deeds are a dynamical. A truly brave man is ever serene, he is never taken by surprise, nothing ruffles the equanimity of his spirit. In the heat of battle he remains cool, in the midst of catastrophes he keeps level his mind. Earthquakes do not shake him, he laughs at storms. We admire him as truly great, who, in the menacing presence of danger or death, retains his self-possession, who, for instance, can compose a poem under impending peril or hum a strain in the face of death. 
Such indulgence betraying no tremor in the writing or in the voice is taken as an infallible index of a large nature of what we call a capacious mind, yo yo, which, for from being pressed or crowded, has always room for something more. It passes current among us as a piece of authentic history that as Oda Dokken, the great builder of the castle of Tokyo, was pierced through with a spear, his assassin, knowing the poetical predilection of his victim, accompanied his thrust with this couplet. Ah! How in moments like these our heart doth grudge the light of life. Whereupon the expiring hero, not one whit daunted by the mortal wound in his side, added the lines. Had not in hours of peace, it learned to lightly look on life. There is even a sportive element in a courageous nature. Things which are serious to ordinary people, may be but play to the valiant. Hence in old warfare it was not at all rare for the parties to a conflict to exchange repartee or to begin a rhetorical contest. Combat was not solely a matter of brute force, it was, as well, an intellectual engagement. Of such character was the battle fought on the bank of the Koromo River, late in the 11th century. The eastern army routed, its leader, Sadato, took to flight. When the pursuing general pressed him hard and called aloud, it is a disgrace for a warrior to show his back to the enemy, Sadato reined his horse, upon this the conquering chief shouted an impromptu verse. 